Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from the 20th chapter of Luke. Jesus is concluding his public teachings. This will be pretty much the last encounter he has with opponents prior to his arrest. The Sadducees, who are the folks we meet in this particular scripture, were a small group, but very influential group in Judaism. Uh, unlike many of the other groups of, in Judaism, such as the Pharisees and the rabbis, they did not believe in a resurrection, uh, something that in Judaism at that time was thought of as an event that would happen at the end of the age, when the dead would be raised. And so let us now listen for what the Spirit may speak to us this day through these words. Let us listen for God. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the, all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This may seem a rather stupid question, but why do people ask questions? I mean, sometimes, quite naturally, people ask a question seeking information they don't have. If I'm lost and I ask someone, can you tell me how to get to Rustico in Arlington? I'm hoping that person knows something that I don't. But questions are not always that simple. Sometimes questions are more about confirmation or validation, more so than about information. Questions about whether or not a dress looks flattering, or whether or not a project that I have completed is well done may or may not be genuine questions. And then, of course, there are religious questions. Someone comes up to me on the street and says, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? It's quite clear that no general exchange of information is about to take place. <laughs> If I answer no, the person is not going to say thank you and walk off. Some of the worst religious questions are those asked by people who disagree with you. Sometimes Christians who consider themselves smart and sophisticated will ask questions to their more fundamentalist friends designed to demonstrate that those friends are actually uneducated adults. Sometimes atheists will ask their Christian friends questions that are drawn from some aspect of the faith that seems particularly ridiculous. And so they might say, now you really don't believe that Jesus did miracles like casting out evil spirits, do you? 
And at least with a question like that, you know ahead of time that to say yes, you're going to get laughed at. And that's the kind of question the Sadducees deal to Jesus today in the Gospel reading. It's a question designed to make Jesus look foolish. And then the Sadducees can laugh at this country rube of a rabbi. It, it may be helpful to know that the, that the Sadducees were an, a well-to-do, elite group with a great deal of power and influence. In, in the religious area, they were quite conservative, though, <clears throat> and they held that only the books of Moses, those would be the first five books of the Old Testament in our Bible, were authoritative in any way. And since they could find no mention of resurrection in those books, they rejected outright any notion of resurrection. They found it laughable in the way that some of us might laugh at the notion of a rapture. The question they asked Jesus is rooted in an old practice known as leveret marriage. <clears throat> it was a kind of social safety net for widows in ancient Israel. <clears throat> in a time when women had no real rights, were not real citizens, to become a widow without any male children left a woman horribly vulnerable. And so requiring that her brother-in-law would marry her not only gave some small amount of protection to widows, but it also provided a means by which that deceased brother's lineage might continue. And so the question about a widow with seven husbands. The, the scenario itself is uh, perhaps implausible, but it is technically possible. And I've often wondered whether or not the Sadducees were able to refrain from snickering as they asked Jesus this very complex tricks question. Wouldn't it be fun to watch Jesus tie himself up in knots over this? Considering that the, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, they have a remarkably conventional notion of it in their question. Resurrection looks a lot like things are here now, just some other place, some other time. It's a view shared by many modern Christians. Resurrection as a, a slight upgrade of sorts. There's the family circus view of this, where Grandpa has his white robe on and looks down to check out how things are going for Billy and his siblings. And then there's the Greek philosophical version of this with an immortal soul that somehow persists and continues after we die. But Jesus is able to easily navigate through the trap that the Sadducees lay for him in large part because he does not have a conventional notion of resurrection. Resurrection for him is part of something that is almost unimaginable. Something so new that only eyes of faith can even begin to glimpse it. Jesus' comment about those who die being, or who are resurrected, being like angels has nothing to do with people who die becoming angels. In the Bible, Angels are an entirely different order and type of creature than humans. They are nothing at all like us, and that is precisely Jesus' point. In the resurrection, something that's not even imaginable right now will take place. I suspect that there's scarcely a, a man, woman, or child, must be on kindergarten, uh, here with us today, who is not at least familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. 
Notice the title of that speech, or, or more to the point, notice what the title is not. It's not, I have a plan. It's not, I have some issues that need to be addressed. Dr. King has a dream. By definition, something that is a bit beyond reality, and indeed his dream is, is audacious to the point of being ridiculous, even impossible. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist and its governor with his lip dripping words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. That was almost unimaginable in 1963. And even more audacious, Dr. King urges African Americans who are suffering under racist oppression not to resort to violence because they are, he says, veterans of creative suffering. Continue to struggle nonviolently, he says, with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. All these years later, when the idea of black and white children joining hands in Alabama is not so far-fetched, it's easy to forget that it took faith to see the dream that Martin Luther King dreamed. Many who revere Dr. King seem to not know or have forgotten this. But his dream, like Jesus' notion of a resurrection beyond Im imagination, it imagined a future that was not simply a bit of an upgrade over how things are now, not about progress or advancement. It was about something unimaginably new. And so as his speech built to its triumphant conclusion, Dr. King returned to Scripture, to the faith from which his dream was born. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The, the rough places will be made plain and the crooked will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, he continues. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew from the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Dr. King could dream such a dream because, like Jesus, he could see something, something that was visible only by faith. Even in the face of hatred and violence and the knowledge that he most certainly would not live very long. He knew by faith that God had hopes and dreams for us beyond anything we could imagine on our own. He knew by faith that God's purposes would be worked out. And so, he knew that the arc of history does bend toward justice. Can you see God's dream? Can you glimpse what the world cannot see? Can you, can you be aware of what is beyond conventional imagining, something greater? Jesus came to earth, you know, not to start a new religion, not to teach a few new doctrines, but to open us to God's newness that is beyond all imagining. 
And He offers us the gift of the Spirit so that God's newness might invade our being, transform our very existence. And then as as God says through the lips of the prophet Isaiah, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Do Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Can you see it? All praise and glory to the one who comes in the power of God that we might be healed and see. Thanks be to God.